Alright everyone, welcome. Thanks for finding time today to attend this session. Um, we'll tell you a story about our approach to applying computer vision to uh, assessing building damage assessment after natural disasters. We'll start with the introduction. Um, Ankit Mittal is a project manager for this project. Uh, my name is Nikolai Sorokin. I'm a data scientist at REA, uh, working on different um, AI use cases. And these are the interns. So my name is Zulfikar Ahmed. I am a master's student at University of Washington in Seattle. And I was involved in the damage detection of the buildings using Mascar CNN, which is uh, a, de a detection algorithm. Uh, I'm Rahul Vindamraj. Um, I'm currently at Thomas Jefferson High School uh, as a senior. And uh, I entered at REI for about eight weeks from June to August. And I was responsible for developing the change detection algorithm. Um, for before and after images. All right. I'll give you the background of the problem. Um, so we all know that the uh, US is famous for uh, brutal hurricanes somewhere in the south, uh, south of the states and uh, um, on the shores. And we have um, uh, natural fires as well in California. So uh, whenever such a large uh, natural disaster strikes, it's important to um, assess the damage uh, to understand the affected areas and, and kind of uh, give a quick estimate of what's going on. Currently, it takes for FEMA days um, to cover all the areas uh, that are affected by a fire or a hurricane. And they, uh, they realize this uh, analytical bot bottleneck they're facing and trying to automate the analysis because it's currently a very laborious process. This is where computer vision kicks in. Um, the solution we are uh, looking at would take the satellite images of the affected areas and quickly, automatically um, run the analysis of the areas of interest, where we can uh, see the damaged areas, uh, flooded uh, um, regions, uh, distracted buildings, and uh, other things that we can develop our solution to. Unfortunately, uh, disaster statistics are not going down from year to year. Um, the damage is in billions and keeps growing, um, especially with the climate change. Uh, things are not really look promising yet. So um, the solution we propose to help FEMA to uh, address this analytical bottleneck is to develop the deep learning based framework which can assess and evaluate different types of damages um, using satellite, in, satellite imagery. The way we look at this problem is um, we would take the satellite image and analyze it in parallel using change detection techniques and semantic segmentation and, you, and then use model assembling to give the weighted uh, solution and give the um, prediction on which buildings have been damaged by the hurricane, for example. Um, currently, we um, have developed a Mascar CNN model to uh, use the semantic segmentation and uh, principal component analysis to do the change detection. Our preliminary results are we've picked the um, uh, best algorithm for the change detection. Um, change detection um, covers, sorry, uh, compares before and after imagery to see uh, what exactly has been changed before, uh, as a result of natural disaster. Semantic segmentation is a deep learning solution um, using neural networks um, that can recognize the damage of the buildings without uh, prior knowledge of the um, um, state of the area. So we don't need the before image to detect the uh, hurricane damage. Currently, uh, the metric we use is intersection of reunion, which um, compares the predicted uh, damage area with the ground roof. And this uh, metric was a, is, a, is a good um, way to estimate how accurately uh, semantic segmentation is um, being done. Zulfikar will cover uh, later what semantic segmentation is. Just take my word for this. I'm just giving the 10,000 view, uh, uh, 10, feet view of uh, what we've done so far. Um, current average precision is um, about 55, 56 percent. 
this sounds low, but we already have ways to improve it and we know what can be done to have much higher results. Um, with this, I'll give word to Rahul to go over change detection uh, algorithms. Yes, so um, the change detection algorithm, as Nicolay said, is exactly that. It's a comparison of the before and after imagery of a given damaged building or area. So when developing the change detection algorithm, I had to go through certain steps. First, of course, I had to gather the data, um, which wasn't very easy, as anyone who has done some sort of project like this knows. Um, I'll get into that later. Pre-processing the data, which means removing some of the noise, hopefully, that comes with the before and after image, especially because they don't overlap really well. Developing the actual algorithm to compare before and after and see which parts of a given building are damaged versus which parts remain fine or functioning. Fine-tuning the algorithm to be more dynamic and elastic, so more buildings in a given picture, for example, or slight even more noise, noise in a given picture. Um, GeoJSON implementation, which I'll get into more later, but essentially it's a file type that allows us to get the polygon or outside of a building more exact to, for the better change detection algorithm. And then the extraction, overlay, and validation also have to do with the GeoJSON. So as for the data set, the first data set I looked into was the AICD data set, which is actually a data set that isn't, it's not real imagery, it's made with computers, and the, the purpose of it essentially is for change detection, I based my algorithm off of it, but the thing is with the AICD data set, it isn't representative of hurricane damage or natural disaster damage at all. So, with, so I had to move on from the AICD data set to a more hurricane damage before and after data set, and um, with that I went to the Hurricane Michael interactive map. So the problem with uh, getting before and after images is usually online for hurricane data, they don't pair the before and after. So I had to use an interactive map with a search feature, which is really important because with that search feature, I can, it's what we call geotag. So I know the exact latitude and longitude of a given building and I can look up that latitude and longitude before and after the event and then crop it using something as simple as a snipping tool. And then I had to scale it to a certain size using GIMP, which is the GNU image manipulation program. So that's how I got my data. An example of my data is, as you can see here, on the left side, yeah, your left, um, you can see the perfectly intact building, which was before Hurricane Michael actually hit Florida. And then after, you can see the same building polygon, essentially, you can tell it's the same building, but it's been ravaged by the hurricane. Um, so the algorithm development uh, is a PCA, or Principal Component Analysis, is what Nicolet referred to earlier. Essentially what this does is it's known as dimensionality reduction technique which um, it's really important for change detection because you don't want to pick up on every single little change from one image to another because like I said earlier, there's a lot of noise between the images, right? So if we go back to here, you can see that this part of the building right here actually isn't damaged over here, but it is a slightly darker shade than this. So if we simply just compare pixel by pixel and see if the pixel's different, it's gonna register this whole image is damaged, which isn't what we want. So the principle of component analysis what it does is, here's a graphical representation of it. If we consider each of these points to be a certain pixel in the RGB space or whatnot, or, or even grayscale, um, the principal component analysis automatically kind of develops these new axes under which the pixels, uh, which maps best or closest to a lot of the pixels in the image. Where the pixels represent the difference image, um, and the difference image is just uh, one pixel subtracted from, let's say you have the after image, you subtract the pixel value of the after image from the before image to get the difference image. Um, so this is for the difference image you run the PCA on, and it creates a set of axes that correlate mostly with, with most of the points. And if a given point is a certain distance or threshold away that you determine from one of these axes, it can be registered as change. So with the PCA algorithm that I developed and implemented, it outputs, if you input a before and after image, it outputs what we call a binary change map, which means if it detects change in a given pixel, it outputs as white. If it doesn't, it's black. So here's an example of running the PCA on this. So you can see that, um, especially with the white areas, they're clearly damaged, which is the most damaged areas right here where the roof is completely torn off and it registered all of that is damaged. If we go back to the original image, you can see there's no damage there. And but what's actually really important is what's, what's black, because over here, you can see there's no damage except for this little area right here where part of it's stripped off. But, and like I said earlier, this is a different pixel value, greatly different than this right here, which is white. So this proves, in essence, that the PCA is a good implementation, um, or a good algorithm to implement for something like change detection. So one drawback of just using the PCA is cropping the images like from an interactive map can lead to unwanted differences outside the polygon. So in the actual change map generated, 
the, for example, let's say a building shift slightly down in one image, the after image and before slightly up. The fact that there's a portion of the building in the before image that is just ground or grass in the after image, if it detects that as change, then that's awful, right? Because let's say there's no damage to a building, but half of the building is grass, then it'll say the building is damaged and FEMA, for, and when this is implemented, FEMA would send aid there, but they realize none of the building is actually damaged. So to, do, to fix this problem, we have, I implemented something called GeoJSON. So GeoJSON is similar to JSON format, which I'm sure a, a lot of you guys know what it is. But what it has, what's really important, is the latitude and longitude of every single coordinate uh, that outlines the polygon of a given building. So the GeoJSON, um, how I access the files for Florida is there's, on GitHub there's an open source, Microsoft has provided the GeoJSON for every single state actually, for every single building polygon. So in Florida there's around 6.9 million buildings for the GeoJSON. And the class GeoJSONParser.py is what goes through these GeoJSON files and what you have to input into this is because, like I said earlier, the interactive map is geotagged, you input a range of latitude and longitude at which you think one building is in, and then it outputs the exact coordinates of the corners of those buildings. So for example, like if it's a rectangular or square building, it would output four, but some buildings have extremely complex shapes, uh, uh, which it outputs you know, like seven or eight of those GeoJSON points. Then, with the GeoJSON, here's an example of it. So you can see the damage in the buildings, the orange parts, and obviously the algorithm doesn't do it perfectly, but it still does a good job of mapping it. Um, but you can see, when, in, like right here, it registers that as damage, even though it's just the front portion of the building, when the before image of this is grass there. That's what registers that as damage. So if we just simply took this one and gave it the threshold saying if there's this many white pixels and register as damage, it would register this as, of course it would register as damage, but let's say it wasn't damaged, right? Then that'd be a problem. So what the GeoJSON parser does is I input the, like, the corners of these buildings, let's say this is 0, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, or like, and like the last coordinate, right? Then the GeoJSON parser goes through every 6.9 million buildings and gets this exact building and overlays it on top. As you can see, it's a rectangle. And then if everything that is not inside the rectangle that's considered the building becomes a black pixel, and then you can actually normally assess the damage. So once I had the GeoJSON overlay and the change detection algorithm, uh, with the PCA pretty much set, I have to determine a threshold to actually classify the building as damaged or not. And the way I did that is actually pretty simple. I just needed to quantify the ratio of white pixels to black pixels in the given GeoJSON space. And so what I had to do is I just counted the white pixels and divided by the total pixels and then, but now I have to actually find validation data to see which threshold of the exact ratio would be, per, would be the best for giving the least amount of false positives and false negatives. So I got 100 before and after image pairs for validation and I ran certain thresholds on them and generated the confusion matrices. So from this, it's a little bit hard to see, but you, you can see the threshold of 0.065 as the ratio is the best threshold to have, as in if it's greater than 0.065 for the ratio, you can classify the building as damaged. It's the best to have in terms of the least number of false positives and false negatives. So you can see there's only three false positives and five false negatives meaning it works with a little, like 92% accuracy with the 100 given uh, pairs. So with a threshold of 0.065, um, we can then classify a building as damaged or not using my change detection algorithm. And another metric to show the accuracy of it is the rock curve. Um, you can see the area under the curve is 0.97, which is, doesn't indicate 97% accuracy really, but it is, it's a good metric to see how accurate it is. And a random classifier that it has no algorithm that just you know flips a coin is it is it damaged or not is this represented by this line right here and you can see that the actual prediction is much better than just flipping a coin. So the final overview of this design um, is so what the algorithm does is it change, generates a change map given the before and after images using the principal component analysis. You have to input the minimum and maximum longitude of the given corners of a certain image and it'll extract the GeoJSON from the file the Florida GeoJSON file and it converts the latitude and longitude to pixel dimensions, meaning let's say it's a 250 by 250 image, then the latitude and longitudes are in you know, degrees west and degrees north or south, correct? So you have to find some sort of scale and convert it to the, the pixel dimension um, by just dividing the, essentially all you do is find, scale it to the pixel dimension by dividing the two coordinates. And then calculate the ratio and using the threshold that was determined from the confusion matrices, classified as damaged or not. So drawbacks with this algorithm is, um, one of the main ones is right now this algorithm only works for if you input one image at a, one image with one building at a time, which isn't great. Um, 
because you know there's millions, like I said, 6.9 million buildings in Florida, and putting 6.9 million images isn't, if, especially if you want to assess damage over a larger area, this isn't very efficient. So the algorithm would have to be fine-tuned to extract multiple GeoJSONs and classify separate buildings as damaged or not damaged. And then um, another thing is getting the before and after images and actually specifically getting the latitude and longitude of every single corner is extremely tedious. That was probably the hardest part about doing this whole thing. So we need something to kind of counter this uh, change detection algorithm, which Zulfikar will go into right now. Hi, good afternoon everybody. So my name is Zulfikar and I was involved in the Mascar CNN for the damage detection. I encourage all of you to please ask questions whenever you feel like during the presentation if you have a doubt. Uh, so let's get started. So uh, Mascar CNN, just to give an overview of what I'll be presenting today, I'll be going over the concept, the architecture of Mascar CNN, the data sets that we collected from NOAA, the hyperparameter tuning that we had while training the uh, particular models that we had, and uh, the entire validation that we did. So to start off, I would like to go out with a few concepts to help understand Mascar CNN better. So in these particular images, you can actually see that we are trying to cover segmentation here. So in the classification image, what classification actually does is that it actually tells that, hey, there is a balloon in the picture. What object detection, uh, what semantic segmentation does is that it tells that, hey, these are the pixels that are involving balloons. So these are the balloons there, and these are the pixels involving the balloons. Object detection in particular says that, hey, these are the particular balloons that you are looking for. So now we are actually accounting for overlapping balloons. In the previous semantic segmentation, you, saw, you can see that if there are two balloons overlapping, the uh, computer would think that it is a single balloon. While as an object detection, it actually identifies that these are two separate balloons, even though there is an overlap between the balloons. In instance segmentation, it actually identifies that, hey, these are the pixels that are involved for each of the balloons. So there is a very small difference between object detection and instant segmentation, but we will be using semantic segmentation and instant segmentation with Mascar CNN and later on the unit model. So the Mascar CNN in particular as a concept is that it is a two-stage framework where the first stage you actually generate regions of interest, you extract features from the actual image, and once you extract those features from the actual image, then you align them, you, pre -pro you process them, and then you start applying the masks on them. So uh, as we can see in this particular diagram, you have the image first, the features are extracted. In this particular image, the feature that you want to extract are the people. So you can see that they actually extract all the regions where the, uh, the model thinks that, hey, this might be a person's face, this might be a person's hand, this might be a person's leg. And then you generate all those regions, and then you compress all of them, and then you apply the model on them. So this is again a general ar architecture of the Mascar CNN, where you have the image, there is a convolution neural network which actually generates all the features, it extracts all the features, and then it produces a feature map. On that feature map, it actually aligns it calling ROI. ROI is region of interest. So it aligns all the regions of interest, and it applies CNN on them again to generate the classes. So if you have three, four things to detect in a particular image, for example, you have an image and you have a refrigerator, you have a table and you have a ball, and you want to identify all three of them, that's when you will apply the last fully connected layer and you will generate all the classes. We have an additional convolution layer which applies the mask on these particular objects that I described. The refrigerator, the ball, and the uh, chairs. Well, the thing that we saw in semantic segmentation was it identifies that, hey, these are the pixels involving the refrigerator. These are the pixels involving the ball. These are the in pixels involving the chair. So that's where semantic segmentation and instant segmentation actually helps us. The architecture that we use for Mascar CNN is the ResNet 50 architecture. This actually helps us extract the features, the initial features that you would like to extract, whether it's a pixel coloration or whether it's a change in pattern or a change in texture or anything of that sort, those are extracted by the ResNet 50 architecture. So ResNet 50 is actually a residual network architecture which can go up to 152 layers deep. The one that we use for this particular model is the ResNet 50, which is 50 layers deep. To give an overview of the data sets that we get, so NOAA actually provides us all the data sets. High resolution satellite imagery from NOAA is received 
after the in the aftermath of any national uh, any natural disasters involving hurricanes so any hurricane since 2003 which is hurricane Is isabel was the first hurricane that they provided data sets for since 2003 to 2019 they provide all the data sets so it's massively available so we have got voluminous data sets to actually pass through the data set that we used for this particular model is the hurricane michael data set and uh, we used about 6,000, 7,000 images for, uh, I, I beg your pardon, 6,000 images for training the model. And uh, in general, NOAA actually releases the data sets uh, one day after the hurricane has subsided or it has migrated. For example, the 2019 Hurricane Dorian, uh, on September 4th, that was the first day that we actually re uh, we got the data set from NOAA. So the hurricane actually went from October, I mean, sorry, my bad. August 29th to September 7th. But the minute it actually deviated from Florida, we got the data set the next day. So it deviated from Florida on September 2nd, and we got the data set on September 4th, taking the Florida coastline and the North Carolina uh, coastline. So these are the images that we actually get from NOAA, which is taken at a massive uh, height level. And the thing is, on this particular image, we cannot process the uh, Mascar CNN because our Mascar CNN has a limitation of processing only 1024 cross 1024 pixels. And this is much more than that. So what we do is that we crop the images to this particular size, 100% zoom level, which involves one building or maybe even two buildings for that matter. <coughs> as you can see that we, have, we crop around 6,000 images such as these uh, with damaged buildings, 4,200 for training, 1,000 images for validation, and 800 images for the test. And after we uh, extracted all those images from the data set, we had to annotate these images for training. Because right now, the model that we had trained on, that, that the model that had come with us, was a pre-trained model on the COCO data set. So the initial uh, example that I gave about you know the model being able to identify a chair, a table, a ball, the model was able to identify all those, but we had to customize it to identify roof damage. So these are the input images that we feed into the model. And once we feed these particular images into the model, these are the predictions. So it correctly identifies the roof damages, it, the contours of the roof damages. And the value that you see along with the roof damage is the confidence with which the machine is saying that, hey, one is actually 100%. So the, mo the machine is literally saying, hey, I'm 100% confident that the damages actually exist in this particular area within this particular contour. So a little bit more about the hyperparameter tuning for the training of the models. So some of the primary hyperparameters that we fine tuned for obtaining the best performing models were the batch size, the iterations, the uh, optimizers that we used for training the model, the image augmentations, and the uh, learning grades. Uh, <coughs> Some of these yielded some really good models. Some of these actually damaged the models in terms of, you know, with a high learning rate, you see that the model crashes within the 10th iteration for that matter. Uh, we've got a notebook which actually uh, consolidates all the uh, hyperparameter fine tuning that we have done, but I will show that a little bit later. Some of the drawbacks is something that I want to highlight upon. So if you can see in this particular image, the roof damage is actually correctly identified. But we can also see that this particular shadow is also classified as roof damage. That is something that we'll have to look into because it cannot be classifying shadows as uh, roof damage. So if we have multiple damages in a building, the noise is something that we'll have to remove in the form of shadow removal. So I have a live demo uh, ready, you know, like kind of with all the images that we have collected from the uh, and also, this is the training. Oh, wait, I think. Uh, just give me a minute. Oh, yeah. Currently, this is the uh, 
can all of you see the image? If that's okay, yeah. So this is the image that we just saw, uh, the one with the shadow. Uh, so we'll try a different image. So this is a, a very interesting image. So um, if I can take this out, that's fine. So it correctly identifies the roof damage, but it also identifies a car uh, as a damaged building because according to the model, any particular change in color, any, any particular change in texture, it identifies as a damage. So we have more training to do. We have a better feed of data that we will require. And uh, so this is another interesting uh, situation where we have some drawbacks, which I mentioned in the particular model. So may we assume that the picture from before the hurricane, that red small car and the black car on the left were present, roughly in those positions? I, I beg your pardon, could you please repeat that? One car is damaged, the other two aren't. From the before picture, before the hurricane, were okay. the other two cars there? Uh, no, but the mask of CNN does not depend on the before and after images. Mm -hmm. It is only the after images. So where the uh, so what, the reason why we use Mascar CNN in the first place is that if change detection fails, meaning that if we do not have before and after pictures, you know, if we have before and after pictures, amazing, we can use change detection. Uh -huh. But if we do not have before and after pictures, because NOAA releases only the after pictures, so when we have only the after pictures, that's when we use Mascar CNN for de uh, detecting the building damages. Yes. Um. Have you considered implementing uh, the uh, GeoJSON uh, to keep it only in line with the house? Yeah, it's uh, like uh, it's our future yeah. work. Yeah. So that's part of our future collaboration where we'll be combining our uh, work because he has used the uh, GeoJSON file, but only for the Florida district. Got but it. if you see the Hurricane Dorian this time did not go to Florida at all; it went to North Carolina. So we'll have to create an entire model which actually accounts for all the 50 states in the United States. So yeah, I'll have a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's going to be a heavy duty implementation. What, uh, what strategies would you need to employ to deal with uh, where the buildings may have actually been moved, such as mudslides picking houses off the foundation or tornadoes tearing up modular houses? In this case, the building will be missing. Uh, the GeoJSON will just identify that the building is not there. Um, so yeah, in this case, we'll have to rely on the data set of uh, coordinates of the building's corners, and we'll just have to look into this polygon that defines the building. If the building is not present, then we just mark it as missing. That is again presuming we have a before and after image. No, because if we no, have, we have to have the after, uh, before and after. Oh, true. So this is only for the dam. Okay, yeah. this is for the washer buildings. Okay, true. So um, and yes. That was a live demo, and there are, there are multiple images. Like I said, we have a huge database of images. The only issue up till now was that we uh, had to personally annotate all these images. Uh, if you could see the annotation, it takes time. It takes a lot of time, especially looking at these images, not too easy. <coughs> so um, it, it, it took 6,000 images for us to attain the current accuracy level that we're achieving of 56% uh, uh, with the mean average precision. Uh, that we uh, mentioned earlier in the slides. Uh, but going forward, we are expecting uh, another data set, which I think Nicola will speak about in the future works. So I have a question for you. Oh, yeah. um, so when you were talking about hyper-tuning the parameters, Correct. Uh, in my mind, uh, I'm wondering to what extent the tuning that you do of these parameters, right, okay. to get to a certain precision, Okay. Your objective is to improve the precision. Correct. Uh, so I'm curious to what extent the training data that you used okay. as your foundation True. that resulted in some accuracy and then you're adjusting that to make it better. Okay. What role does that play if you had a much larger data set to train on? True. Would the process of hyper tuning the parameters Let's say it, it's, the volume is much more. Yes. Uh, maybe the very first attempt you make, Correct. the precision is much higher than the data set that you use. Correct. I'm just trying to understand the relationship between the training data set, the level of tuning that you're doing, okay. and the precision, the, the whole process of tuning. Okay, that's a great question because that's exactly the reason why I had the 
uh, workbook out here. So in this particular uh, Excel sheet, we had actually tried all the parameters with regards even to the data set. So initially we trained it with 2,000 images and we uh, noticed the results. So the results that we achieved were pretty good, but then we increased the data set to 4,000 images. The results dropped a little bit. Then we introduced another 2,000 images. So eventually we went to 6,000 images. And at 6,000 images, the results were good, but the improvement of the model is uh, it's like a curve. So the more you improve, doesn't mean that it's, it's not linear. So the more sure. you improve it, doesn't mean that it's the model is going to perform better. It means that there's going to be a slight improvement only, uh, there's only going to be a slight improvement as you increase the data set. But with regards to the first part of your question where you mentioned as to uh, the foundation of our data set and what our model, uh, I mean initially when we had trained it, what, the thing is that our particular model was pre-trained to identify common objects in context, the COCO data set. Mm. So the COCO data set is developed by Microsoft mm -hmm. and they have developed this data set to identify common objects in context such as, like I said, a ball, a chair and a table. All three in the same pick, they'll be able to identify that. So they were able to identify 81 particular classes such as these, you know, whether it's a ball, toothbrush, suitcases. So this particular model has already been trained upon that. So when we try to train this particular model for the first time on our roof damage data set, it gives us a discernible result. It gives us uh, maybe the, the damages that we got, maybe only half the damages are identified. Uh, but then once you start playing around with the par uh, parameters such as the architecture, the number of images, I mean the number of images per GPU is a very minor factor, but such as image augmentation and the optimizers, that results in the uh, model trying to understand that, okay, this is the entire contour of the uh, damage of the particular building. So right now we have done it only for roof damage, but going forward we will also look to uh, track tree damage, maybe even road damage, in a particular picture of course. We can, uh, the, the, there are ser several issues with all of this, because road damage, you know, it is a continuous road, you cannot identify a particular road in a 300 cross 300 image as road damage. You know, there might have been somebody who just threw some garbage on the road and that might be classified as road damage. So uh, there are some issues with regards to that, but we look forward to adding more classes from roof damage, tree damage, and road damage going forward. So, so the follow-up question on that is, okay. as you are striving to make it better, True. you can tweak the architecture, Definitely. you can tweak the parameters. Correct. Uh, I'm just curious, as a designer of the solution, when do you say, man, this is enough, man, this is the most I can do, this is the best thing that I have to offer? Okay, so uh, the way we actually went for that is that once we, uh, so once we achieved a particular level of uh, accuracy and we saw that the improvement of, per, I mean, the so-called improvement, like when you increase the parameters, that actually does not result in any particular significant change in the uh, accuracy or the average precision, uh, that's when we stop. That's the particular stopping point with regards to the data set and with regards uh, to the particular hyperparameter uh, hyper tuning that we are carrying out. So the data sets, when we saw that above 6,000, there is no change, there is no discernible change, we stopped at 6,000. Uh, 6, but that is also dependent on how we have annotated the data. So the thing is, we are expecting another data set called the XBD data set, which is going to be distributed by uh, the DIU and uh, Crowd AI, which is a startup. So that has close to 100,000 uh, 100, images to 200,000 images. Or over, over half a million, sorry. Half a million buildings. Yeah. Half a million buildings, but the number of images in itself is 100,000 to 200,000. So uh, those will be better annotated. The hope is that those will be better annotated and those will be labeled because we will not have to do the annotation and labeling else we will have to utilize the entire REI force for that. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, you know, that kind of, those will already be annotated. And then we will see what kind of performance we'll see. And if, if we see that uh, there is still no improvement with regards to the, uh, uh, with the accuracy and the precision, in spite of 100,000 images with the same parameters that we have, uh, that will indicate that, okay, we'll need to change the hyperparameters. To what extent did you fool around with the architecture, the number of layers? So there were two architectures that we had uh, uh, 
played around with, which is the ResNet 50 and the ResNet 101. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the ResNet 101 is a much deeper architecture. So any kind of training that we do on it, it's going to take double, uh, not sure. necessarily the, double the time, but more often than not, it's going to take a lot more time than ResNet 50. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we know that ResNet 101 is actually going to give us a better result eventually. Mm. So we use the ResNet 50 and we uh, played around with all the other hyperparameters, such as the number of images, base learning rate, image augmentation. And then when we went to ResNet 101, we saw that the ResNet 101 did not perform better than ResNet 50. So that's where we have to start, you know, like kind of contemplating, okay, should we actually play around with the ResNet 101 features as well or not? So, yeah. So I had a question that might kind of offer a snarky answer to Shem's question, but another important one, which is, I assume you just keep going until the client's happy or they stop paying you. Yeah. Um, but that, that, well, that one brings, of the two, yes. <laughs> that, that brings into, into focus, okay. you kind of hinted at one client problem, and I'd like to ask you about another one. One client problem you said was, well, they need to figure out where to provide disaster recovery funding to rebuild the buildings. <coughs> and I think that would be quite interesting, but I would be even more interested, in, and this, this would drive kind of perhaps a different technical challenge on the same topic. Is it something where this could be used to be able to say, that house or that building is where the problem is, let's go do res rescue. And, and in order to do that, of course, you need to be able to have the information available, presumably within less than 24 hours, maybe you know four to eight hours, as opposed to you know probably a week later would be okay for the funding, maybe even a longer term than that. So my question is kind of how fast can it go, but more generally, kind of have you thought about what is the application, where and who would use it for what purpose? Is it rescue? Is it long-term recovery and rebuild? Is it something else? So the main focus of this is to direct the relief and aid to these particular places. The images that we showed you were of one particular building, but the XBD data set, like I said, that we are awaiting, I could actually show you a sample of that, is about 50, image, 50 buildings in one particular image. And our model can actually process that. And when you say relief and aid, do you mean food or medical care or building materials get delivered? What do you mean? This is mostly to estimate the damage done. Um, how many buildings have been damaged, how many buildings have been destroyed mm -hmm. or missing, things like that. Yeah. Unfortunately, this thing cannot do any magic. Let's say if you can, sure. if you can, if you can say if the particular building uh, has people inside and needs rescue, if you can't say that by looking from the helicopter, neither can the neural right. network. And I'm, I'm not really expecting an answer, but what I'm kind of doing is posing a Socratic question, which is if yeah. you think at the end of the day, is our purpose rescue, that gives you a different parameter. You know, we need to get this, we need to find data sets that are available in 24 yeah. hours or less. Whereas if you're thinking about, as, as you suggest, kind of relief, which in my mind means deliver water, deliver food, perhaps deliver building materials, or recovery, which means send money so they can rebuild, those are three kind of different business purposes that might lead you to, to choose different sources of data, achieve different levels of precision, and, and you know, of course, different levels of timeliness and response. Um, and so thinking through kind of what that business purpose is might give you a, a more impactful way to structure it. Um, but the bottom line is, I think this is great. I think FEMA might be very interested in this. Great to know. And we'll talk about the challenge also, right, towards the future work sure. that yeah. we can relate with the FEMA. So actually, yeah, FEMA is aware that uh, um, computer vision solutions exist. That's why uh, just like a couple of weeks ago, they released a public challenge, uh, which we are planning to participate in. Uh, the challenge is, the challenge includes over half a million buildings and is uh, designed to uh, address the same issue, the, the detect the damage and, and assess the damage whether it was minor, major, or destroyed. This is even wider than what we're doing, and uh, the data set is uh, uh, huge. Uh, it's been crowdsourced, uh, developed, um, and it uh, will be publicly available probably next week. Uh, we're planning to jump on this uh, once, it's, once it's available. Yeah. And also to answer what uh, Sham had asked earlier, right? so if it's not about the same images or same text or same kind of data, no matter what portion of neural net we are applying, but in this case, it is all six types of disasters. 
as of now we have not even used any flooding uh, uh, area image. We have not used any kind of fire for that for us to be highly different look of image than a uh, reg sure. uh, regular roof damage. Sure. Right? So over there, it, when we introduce that kind of data, then definitely uh, the learning of, of the model will increase positively. It's just that if you have same set of data, same set of model getting changed, then the number of images is, could be even overfitting. Because if we keep showing the roof which is always the black in color, maybe the, the next time if the roof is white in color, it will actually may or may not be able to predict that part also. Mm -hmm. So that's where the time when we decide when we don't have to train it further. Mm -hmm. Along with all the parameters, the ROC curve, and everything which these guys were talking about. Sure, and uh, I haven't spent any time, so I'm impressed by you guys stacking this problem and coming up with it. My curiosity is, did we question the ResNet 50 foundation? I mean, that somebody yeah, said, hey, this is a good application of yes. this architecture. Yes. What if, forget about ResNet 50, what if we add layers that are different? Now experimenting with that and see what results we got. That's what my curiosity is. Yeah, we stay on top of the latest industry standards. ResNet 50 has been performing uh, very well and it's a ground start for us. Mm -hmm. But there are other architectures that we're planning to explore, like uh, LinkNet, Jeremy uh, UNet, and yeah. all those others, uh, neural network architectures that are there. We just have to try them. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, I, other, uh, yeah. I'd like to know a couple of, uh, or at least one question and one comment. So, so just like when they show uh, the hurricane uh, sort of moving in, right? There are like, I don't know, like a dozen models, uh, including one by our own president, you know, that tried to show this case where the hurricane is going to go, right? Yeah. So, is it fair to say that you know that as different uh, teams sort of try to tackle this problem, that they will end up basically with different um, uh, you know sort of uh, assessments of the damage, and that there is really no sort of like you know perfect answer. I'm just trying to figure like, or you see that in like you know all the solutions converging towards uh, sort of like you know the same kind of pattern, uh, same kind of pattern. So uh, one thing about the data set in particular is that these data sets are in the aftermath of a hurricane. So it's not during that the hurricane, it's not when the hurricane is in uh, you know, action that you actually get these images. So it is in the aftermath of the hurricane. So after the hurricane has subsided or it has migrated, more importantly when it has migrated from that particular place, that's when you get the images. So uh, with regards to the direction of the hurricane, I'm uh, uh, I think that I was just trying to give a, uh, an analogy, okay. uh, you know, just like different uh, you know, models exist to forecast Correct. the path Correct. of the hurricane. Correct. And we see the visualization in the media, right? Yeah. About like, you know, what is the forecasted path, right? Sure. Um, and you know, only one of them basically is accurate. But you can see in, in some cases, I think like, you know, there is some convergence, right? Correct. Correct. So I'm just curious that as, uh, you know, different teams try to tackle, uh, you know, using different approaches, uh, this, this, this challenge of damage assessment, uh, you know, would we end up basically, you know, with different assessments, yeah. And, you know, and then if you overlay, we all know that, okay, you know, sometimes they say this model gets right, sometimes sure. this model gets right. Or do you feel like, you know, uh, doesn't matter which model you use, ultimately it's just going to converge and, you know, people are, we are all going to get similar answers. That depends yeah. on the scale that we use. Like, for example, this particular scale that you can see, it's a, it's a damage scale. So if we use the scale and if somebody else uses the scale, perfectly fine. Our answers will converge. But if someone uses a different scale, for example, if their assessment of uh, say major damage is something else with regards to you know maybe half the building is washed out uh, and then they say that okay uh, that is going to be our threshold for ma uh, major damage like half the building half the building or half the house getting washed out that is our threshold of major damage and for them it is just like you know the entire building getting washed out is major damage that's when we'll have you know maybe two different answers but not converging but, but not diverging that much we will eventually converge but not, uh, we wouldn't be diverging very much if we use similar scales of so I think I'm not talking the metric, I'm not talking the threshold. You're, you're, you're asking basically whether different architectures will give drastic drastically different results. Right. So currently there are just um, two or three major architectures that are used in the as an industry standard. They all kind of um, perform about the same level. The matter of, um, Currently, the, the battle is about like half a percent of accuracy here, half a percent there, and uh, different 
uh, hyperbaric optimizations, which yeah. require huge computing powers. So I think uh, I'll uh, make my second question or comment or thought that is going to be mine. So, so this uh, defense innovation unit has come up with this challenge, right? Which is what you guys referred to, right? And uh, it's you know they are they are asking for multiple teams to compete, uh, you know, and then they're going to rank an award, right? So do you think that the ranking is is more based on the precision or the accuracy of the model, okay? Or is it more about the overall experience of how usable your model is? I know how quickly can I actually know? Uh, even though I think like you know it is 80% accurate, I, it is very responsive to my mission needs, right? So I'm just sort of curious to understand you know if ultimately I think like you know you guys see convergence, then how are how are these models going to be differentiated? No, so, be uh, or, think or should we be thinking slightly differently and say okay hey you know where is our overall experience of how you can actually make the results more consumable by business users. For example, we take the results of this model, tie that with you know, the FEMA's uh, you know, uh, formula for actually allocating the financial resources and tell them that, okay, hey, look, you know, what you should take you like, you know, two months, you know, now you can do basically like in two weeks, right? And tell them that whole workflow. And then whatever are the areas where you need human assistance, we find like ways to crowdsource, you need to basically, you know, uh, co-opt basically the different um, entities to to give that data, as opposed to trying to say, hey, we all have to do it ourselves. Yeah. So such competitions are usually uh, evaluated automatically. So um, the model that you um, send to them is being ran against the same test test set, and it all boils down to bare numbers, whichever performs the best. So what we are developing is strictly a backend solution, which can even have um, uh, user experience or kind of other features that we can provide with it. So the so the, the compensating features that you added, for example, you say how do I remove shadow? How do I eliminate yeah. traps? Yeah. It Those are be... decisions that each team can make on their own. Yeah. But the basic assessment, like you know, no matter who does the model, you are saying that it's it will go to the they all get similar results. So it's the add-ons that we do about like you know how are we eliminating the noise that could be one way in which you know our model can be better than others. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so I was looking at the hypertuning parameters. So do you try anything with the uh, loss functions? I couldn't see any loss functions that you have. Uh, did uh, did you try with different loss functions? Uh, and do you mean loss functions in like the cross entropy and loss function. Did you? there are different loss functions, right? Uh, when you are training the model. Oh, you're talking about the optimizers in particular, like the stochastic gradient. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we did try a bunch of them in fact, you know, like kind of just, um, let's yeah. Uh, so we tried the stochastic gradient, uh, just, give me a minute. The Adam, uh, Adam with defaults, RS props, ADA grade, uh, NEG, ADA, uh, ADA delta. And finally, we realized that the SGD, which is the uh, stochastic gradient uh, descent, that worked the best for our particular model. So the thing is, we ran it in terms of iterations. So every 5,000 iterations, we actually stopped and created a particular model. Uh, so the number of iterations, that's again another hyperparameter uh, hyperparameter that we played around with. So initially, we ran it for 90,000, and we saw that you know it's towards the end you were starting, you were getting the best model, which ideally means that the best performance of the model still hasn't yet come. So you can run it for another 100,000 iterations more to see eventually where the best performance of the model comes. Uh, so that's actually something that he mentioned to me. You know, Usually when the uh, uh, last iteration of the model or somewhere towards the last iteration of the model, you start getting the best result, that means that you can still push the uh, model even further to see where exactly does it start overfitting. So the the exact area, if you can see the number of iterations is uh, the total number of iterations we ran. And the best iteration is from when, that, that is the best performance iteration. From then on it starts overfitting. So uh, initially we started with 90,000, then we went to 200,000, and then we finally settled down on 160,000. So, yeah. So you're training on like a CPU or a GPU? GPU. <laughs> CPU, I think. So 100,000 makes sense. Sure, sure. Thank you.
Did you have fun? Yeah, I actually did. Loads, loads of fun. Too. <laughs> loads of fun? Yeah. Lots of lots of fun. Are you still on your summer work internship or are you finished and you came back? Uh, it's me. I finished because I'm still in high school actually. So uh, school started for me in August, at the end of August. So I finished and I came. I left school early actually and drove here to present. Cool. <laughs> I'm still, I mean, tomorrow's my last day. So. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you for coming. Awesome. 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 Um, no, I was just going to cover the future work, um, the yes, last slide, uh, I mean, it, I just wanted to, I think I, we, I've covered it essentially, yeah. um, just wanted to mention that we will be working on different um, architectures that are left, which is, uh, we're planning to ensemble uh, Masker, CNN and UNET, and this is the picture of UNET architecture, which is uh, encoder, decoder kind of implement uh, GeoJSON to extract um, polygons from the maps. Are you guys uh, thinking of writing some kind of a research paper on peer uh, review journal? Not necessarily because this has already been developed and this is already open source. UNIT and Mascar CNN. Mascar CNN has been open sourced by Facebook and a UNIT there's already an implementation of it in different back uh, you know it's, yeah. it's there in a PyTorch backend and uh, you know TensorFlow backend as well. So if there's a new result that we gain from Mascar CNN, uh, maybe then. <laughs> yeah, if we um, will achieve a good results on the challenge, then definitely yeah. we should. No, I think to me, uh, I'm not talking about the uh, the models, but the fact that we have done this experiment and all the results that you guys have uh, produced, what are the lessons you have learned? What is stopping us from you know writing a white paper? Uh, research paper and say, okay, hey, you know, we used all these technologies, this is what we found. Because just in this presentation, I heard some uh, insights, for example, you know, the ResNet 100, is it really better than the ResNet 50, things like that. But there, were, I mean, there are a lot of things I'm sure that we can point out. So I, I would strongly recommend that you, know, you find what is appropriate, maybe, you know, I don't know if Jeff or his team can help uh, identify right uh, target, but I think this could be a great uh, thing for you guys to consider uh, the present. We uh, have all the material, uh, figure out how you can package it, and you know, put it out there. If there isn't enough for a white paper, you at least it's good enough for an article on media. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. I, I do wonder, not too far down the road, although probably unknown to most of, most of us, there's an agency called the National Geospatial Imagery Agency. And their job is to basically type really high resolution pictures and notice when things have happened, like uh, North Korea has moved a missile around or something like that. And so, I, you know, I don't know what kinds of technology they use or what kinds of applications they make of it. But, you know, my, my curiosity is, you know, is this new better different than what they're doing or just kind of paralleling it except for a civilian application? I, I don't know. But I wonder whether or not, have, you, have any of you heard anything about, you know, does NGA already do something like this? I know they probably do, but we don't know yeah. what exactly they they employ on site. I know a lot of it is based though. Um, it's there's a, yeah there's a lot of uh, probably close competitions yeah, exactly. between Google and Facebook. And yeah, true. Yeah, and I know like um, the NGIA they at least uh, they probably don't release much information about you know their models or whatnot because it is pretty high tuned, but are like very private as well because if they release that then other countries can use that and they could take advantage of their model of course. But I still know there's a lot of manpower that goes into those. It's not completely automated, of course. Um, and like you said, ours is more for civilian use as well. Um, maybe not the model itself, but like it more directly, it does a different thing than what NGIA does. Um, NGIA, like you said, it sees if there's a major move, like if North Korea, you know, like mobilizes troops or like checks if there's a missile or not. But ours, I think it's just like a different purpose. It's like orthogonal almost to what NGIA does in that sense. And you guys, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.